I'm going to start by asking Everett, how would you describe the Affordable Care Act? If we looked at, at what the Affordable Care Act is, we really kind of got down to it. As it stands alone, it's, it's not enough to really achieve the, the goal of health care reform, uh, which is basically to provide care at an affordable level uh, to the entire country and to everybody who doesn't have it. Um, but what, it, what this piece of legislation really is, is just an expansion of the number of people that are going to be able to have health care insurance. Uh, and like, like you said, there's a certain, particularly in Florida, there's, you know, in other states it's not as bad, but in Florida we have a large uh, portion of the population that does not have health care insurance coverage. And that causes a drain on the system. Uh, because people don't get care, they just show up to the emergency room and that increases the cost for everyone. Basically there's the individual mandate uh, whereby everyone who does not have insurance through their employer uh, is in essence commencing in 2014, going to have to go out into the private marketplace and those are all those exchanges that you hear about and purchase insurance. And if they don't, there'll be kind of a penalty associated with it and that penalty will build up uh, year after year. The other part of it is the employer mandated insurance. So employers that are, have 50 or more employ, full time employees and full time is 32 hours or more. So it's not 40 hours, 32 hours or more. Uh, the employer is going to have to get, or is going to have to sponsor insurance for them. Uh, the cost can be shared with the employee, uh, but there is a, a, a test basically, uh, at, there's an affordability test, so it can't be the entire burden can't be on the employee. So that's going to be an added cost for employers. And that employer mandate goes into effect next year, 2015. Okay, so there was a, a one-year delay. And then the big portion that is not currently in effect in Florida, the other portion is going to be done through, um, through the expansion of the Medicaid program. Uh, Florida, the Supreme Court, when they came out with their ruling upholding the constitutionality of the uh, statute, uh, kind of gave uh, an out, and they, they determined that states can opt out of the Medicaid expansion. And what the Medicaid expansion basically is, is, you know, the states can opt in or opt out, and the federal government will cover for the first three years 100% of the cost of that, but after that the states start sharing, so that's why Florida has kind of had some pushback. Uh, and in the Medicaid expansion, they're opening up the eligibility, they're expanding eligibility. So there are people that fell below that poverty line uh, that were covered before, but if you were just over it, you, you weren't eligible for Medicaid. Uh, so now under the expansion, there is an additional set of, of, of people that, that are going to be able to be Medicaid recipients. Uh, so that's a big portion of, uh, of the overall uh, scheme. And how are they going to pay for that? Because again, there's going to be subsidies for people that go into the marketplace. Uh, there's all sorts of penalties, uh, there's all sorts of, um, of taxes that are being levied, let's say, on device manufacturers. So there's, it's all sorts of funding sources going back and forth uh, to, to kind of pay for those subsidies uh, and kind of put the whole system in place. Uh, but again, at the end of the day, all that we're really talking about is more people that are going to be covered by insurance, and as a result, more people are going to sign up for insurance, and as a result, the entire covered marketplace is going to expand. Um, one thing that I think is often um, uh, not clear, but I have a friend who is a free market uh, major fund investor who says this to me at every opportunity. He actually lives in London, but he's an American. Uh, and Andy points out on an ongoing and regular basis that currently large businesses that provide health insurance, and I, if you, like I do, work for a large company, you cherish that health insurance, um, actually get a tax benefit that helps pay or offset the cost of that insurance. Um, so I think that's one thing. And another is that for small companies under 50 employees, it is not mandatory that they provide health insurance to their employees, but they will pay some penalties if they do not provide that insurance. Is that accurate? Employers under 50, so those are small employers, uh, they are not subject to providing... There's not a penalty. 
the insurance. They're, they're exempt from that. Okay. Okay. However, um, you know, from a, an employer standpoint, you know, because what's going to happen if you think about it is, well, another, a large employer that is going to provide insurance or another smaller employer that is providing insurance is going to give that benefit. So if you look at how that's going to work out in the marketplace, you know, you have to, you have to offer competitive benefits. Or employee else retention. And so there is a special exchange set up just for the small employers so that the employers can go and buy kind of smaller group insurance, uh, hopefully at more competitive rates than they're getting right now. Roger Gonzalez, what are you seeing in terms of the impact um, on, on companies and how they're responding? Small employers, one through 49, uh, in reality, it doesn't take effect until your renewal policy comes on board. Right now, you're paying whatever rates you're paying in 2013. There's no tax penalty for small businesses. If they provide insurance, they have to provide affordability, a plan that at least pays 60% of the total cost. If that premium happens to be 9.5% nine, nine, nine higher than the income of the employee, then that employee can go to the exchanges. Otherwise, if it's an affordable plan and the premium is less, that employee cannot go to the exchanges, though they cannot get a subsidy. And the employer has to pay 50% of the premium. You should also know there's only one company, there's only one insurance company in the small group exchange, which is different from the individual exchange. Nine companies on the individual exchange, only one, so you're limited. And the more companies outside, just about all the major carriers, have more plans available outside the small group exchange. I want to make sure you guys understand the differences. The individual, yes, the nine companies out there. So um, they have to make a decision. I, at some point, um, the small employer or any kind of employer never have to pay uh, any insurance. They do it because they want to retain, they want to get good people. So how much are you going to invest on that employee. If it becomes unaffordable for whatever reason, then those employees could go to the exchange and try to get some sort of subsidy. It goes according to salaries, could start at 11,490 all the way to 46,000. So there's subsidy calculators available. We have one on our website that tells you how do you qualify for that. So uh, the different rules, and again, uh, 50 and above, it doesn't take effect until 2015. And they do have to pay um, a penalty uh, of $2,000 per person, except for the first 30 employees. So it could be significant, but they, they don't have to make the decision. Some people say, I'd rather pay the penalty. Uh, I think most employees would, would offer some sort of insurance to them.